Rise with Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. all right. Okay, we have a request for, uh, to address the board from Mindy Dom from the Amherst Survival Center. Mindy, if you'd like to come up. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I'm the executive director of the Amherst Survival Center, and I've been wanting to come and give you an update on the programs that are available for Granby residents and how Granby residents already utilize Amherst Survival Center services. So to give you a sense, last year we had about 215 visits from Granby residents. They may not have been, you know, 215 people, probably not. It was probably about 20, 25 people with return visits. Um, but you, I, so I thought I'd give you an overview of what's at the Survival Center, and then specifically, there are some programs that Granby residents can take advantage of that I want to make sure gets on the record and that people know about them, both you and whoever's watching and town residents. So our mission is to connect residents of Franklin and Hampshire County to food, clothing, health care, wellness, and community, and to do it primarily through volunteers. So I'm just going to take each piece of that, and that can kind of outline our programs for you. So in terms of food, we have um, a fresh food distribution program where every day we're open, people can come in, they get a ticket. You're more than welcome to come sometime. I'd love to give you a tour. Mm -hmm. um, and they can access fresh, free fresh produce and baked goods. That produce and baked goods is actually picked up earlier in the morning by a series of teams of volunteers who are going out and recovering food from supermarkets and businesses in the area, and in the summer from also farms. So fresh food distribution is one way that anybody who comes to the center, wherever they live, can get fresh produce. We also have a daily breakfast bar and a very delicious, free and nutritious daily hot lunch. Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday from 12 to 1. Um, and when I say it's delicious, it's quite something. And when people come, they're like, oh, this is not what I expected. And I think it's because they're expecting sort of soup and bread. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we have soup and bread, but we also have brown and white rice, a green salad, a fruit salad, lots of vegetarian options, meat, chicken, fish. So there's plenty. And there's also plenty to go around. We look at the meal as sort of a community as well as a food program. It's the way we build community by sharing a meal together. And it also helps people get an extra meal that they may need. We have a limited number of to-goes. So let's say somebody from Granby might work in Franklin County and they are on their way to work or they have a doctor's appointment in the area and they can't stay for lunch. They can come in at noon and pick up a to-go and leave. Our mission is really about food security. We want to make sure that people aren't going hungry and that they're not needing to divert resources away from some other necessity in order to eat as much as they may already be. We want to reduce their challenges. The third food program that we have, though, is limited to people who live in 13 towns, and Granby is one of those towns. And this is actually one of the reasons why I'm here, is because since um, it's limited to 13 towns, I really want to make sure that people who live in those 13 towns know about this program. It's an emergency food pantry, and when you come to visit us, when you come and see the food pantry, you'll see that it looks like a little grocery store where we have a lot of volunteers who help us. So someone signs in to register for the food pantry. It's based on self-disclosure of need. We do not check financial documents. We don't ask for bank statements. Um, we don't require any financial documentation. The person self-discloses that they're in need. The only thing we require in the pantry is that they bring a proof of where they live so that we can document that they live in one of the 13 towns. So someone can bring a license, a health insurance card, a lease. For their kids, they can bring school forms, health insurance forms, things like that. And they can sign up a whole family. So the pantry is kind of unique because every, all the other programs at the center, which I'll also elaborate in a moment, people can come every day and use. The pantry is a monthly program. You come in once a month, and you get enough food to feed each person in your family for five days that month. So that's 15 meals per person. And you can sign up an entire family as long as you have all the proofs of residence for everybody. And your whole family doesn't have to be there when you get the food. In other programs in the Survival Center, the other people who are gonna benefit have to be there to access it. The food pantry, it's kind of like if when you go to Stop and Shop or a supermarket to shop for your family. 
but you sign in so that we're tracking how often you're coming just to make sure that people come once a month. I want to give you a sense of what the pantry provides. So we have a whole lot of canned food and non-perishables. We also have cereal, pasta, rice. We have fresh milk, cheese, eggs. We have prepared foods like salads and sandwiches and dips from Whole Foods mm -hmm. and Trader Joe's. And we have frozen meat, frozen chicken, frozen fish, and frozen protein, like a vegetarian protein. We also make sure that we're buying fresh produce for people who use the pantry, so that in every grocery distribution, there'll be one or two fresh fruits and a couple of um, fresh vegetables. We also have baby diapers. We also have adult diapers. We have pet food, and we have personal care items. All those items are items that people need on a regular basis, and sometimes they skip a meal in order to afford them. So sometimes uh, there's a notion called diaper need. Sometimes parents will forego dinner to buy diapers. A couple of years ago in Amherst, we did a diaper drive. I don't know if it was done in Granby. I don't remember there being a collection site down here. And the best part about the diaper drive, not only to collect all the diapers, was that afterwards people said to me, I didn't realize how expensive diapers were. That was the best part. Because you know it's about forty dollars a box, and if you're feeding a baby, they got to have diapers. You can't use SNAP or food stamps to buy them. You can't use other kinds. WIC doesn't provide for it. So, um, providing those diapers is a big plus. What does that mean? It means that residents of Granby who might be struggling can sign up for the pantry, and if they don't want to take a full load of groceries initially because maybe they're feeling shy or they're feeling like they don't want to take it from somebody else, which is a common feeling, or maybe they don't feel that they're as bad off as somebody else, but they're struggling. Mm -hmm. They either missed a utility bill, maybe it's really hard um, to pay the rent, or if you, if you ask them a simple question like, um, as in the past year, has it ever been hard for you to think about the, where you're going to get food at the end of the month, and they say, well, once in a while, that's a good reason to come to the food pantry. And if they don't want a full grocery load, because they get, they, it's based on a point system, so they can get maybe 30 pounds, 50 pounds per family, depending on how big it is, they can just come and get milk, diapers, cheese, and frozen meat, and produce. They don't even have to get the canned food. They don't like the peanut butter, don't get the peanut butter, get the tuna. You know, if you don't want the tuna, then don't skip it. You know, if you, we break our allocation down by the USDA guidelines. So that means that like grains are all together. So if they don't want rice or cereal or oatmeal, they can get macaroni and cheese. You know, so it's, it's really sort of participant directed and it's a way to really help people. The pantry has, because we sign people up and we don't really do that in any other program at the center, the pantry has a unique ability to sort of target specific needs, like a diaper distribution, right? So we know how old the kids are, so we can say to people when they come in, it looks like you have um, kids who may be wearing diapers, do you need diapers today? We know, how many, we know people's gender and age, so that meant this year we could say, we're gonna start making sure that women ages 15 to 50 have an opportunity to get feminine hygiene products. But it also means that we can create programs for specific population challenges. And we have a one that comes to mind that I think would benefit families with school-aged children in Granby. So in, uh, in a lot of schools, they provide lunch for kids who are struggling. But during school vacations, there's no lunch. There's no school lunch. And so for some of those families, that's a, tough, that's a tougher time, whether that's a vacation for one week in April or two and a half months in the summer, which makes it harder, it means that all of a sudden those families are sort of put in a spot where they have to come up with additional resources to pay for their family's meals, but nobody's giving them extra resources. So what we, decide, we designed in the pantry was a couple of years ago we created a program called the Kids Boost, which meant that in every month that has a scheduled school vacation, so there are six of them in a year, every family that has kids of school age, five, to 18 years old will get extra food per child in those months. It's not for the whole vacation time, just like the allocation is only five days, right. not 30 days a month, but it's, a, it's about four to eight extra meals, depending on how long the vacation is. It helps, it's an extra milk, it's extra fruit, it's extra kids' snacks, it's extra cereal. So it sort of relieves the burden on the family to all of a sudden come up with resources because chances are that's not going to happen. It means the parents are going to go hungry during that time. We don't want that to happen either. So that's, I really want to kind of sort of promote 
the pantry, but also let people know that you don't have to come every month. You could come just in months that have school vacation. The, the program is a monthly program. A lot of people don't use it every month. Let me tell you what we see in the pantry right now for Granby residents, which makes me feel like there's room to grow because I'm sure there may be more people who are feeling economically challenged who didn't know about the program. And so I, I just want to share this information with you. Right now, there's a total of 43 individuals who are getting food from the pantry in 19 households, because that's how we sort of identify it. Um, we have about a dozen kids, which is good, because that means that when those families come in those school vacation months, they're going to get the boost. It's right. not something you have to ask for. It's something we say you're going to get extra food this month. We have seven people over the age of 60. Maybe there are more people who are over the age of 60 who could use that program, something that I'll be talking about with the Senior Center in a couple of weeks. Um, and the number of pounds that we distributed to Granby residents is the kind of data, the only program at the center that does this is the pantry, crank out this data, um, is 13,399 pounds of food last year in 2017, um, which that's a decent amount of food, but there may be more people who could use it. So to give you a sense of the boost, in last year's boost months, so that's February, April, um, June, July, August, and December, there were four households that participated in the boost. So I don't know if there are more, but there could be more. You know, times get tough. People's circumstances yeah. change. We see a lot of people in the pantry who come into the pantry when someone either maybe loses a job, gets a bad diagnosis, and then they stay there for a while, and then they stop. And maybe we don't see them again. They just came in to help them. I'm going to try and talk faster. I'm sorry I'm taking so much time. Right. So I brought some brochures on the pantry. But I also wanted to let you know of our other programs. So in terms of food, we have meals. We have food pantry. We have fresh food distribution. In terms of clothing, we have a free community store, which means it's a store made up of donations of clothing, household items, books, DVDs, CDs, shoes, toys, kids' clothes, and small household appliances, linens, tablecloths, towels. And it's free. Everything in it is free. If anybody ever comes to you and says, I went to the Survival Center and I got this great shirt for $5, I need to know about it because that should not have happened. Um, it wouldn't happen from a staff person, but I can't promise anybody else. But everything is free. And so people can come to the store with a reusable bag of their own if they want and take, get 15 items. And so this is another way that we're trying to sort of offset food security. Sometimes um, at the beginning of the school year, particularly, people may say they don't have enough clothes for their kids. This is a way for them to get clothes. It's an exchange. And we ask that when people donate, they keep it to seasonal, clean, not torn, not ripped, not stained clothes. Clothes you would wear, or better. Um, same thing with shoes, no holes in them. They can be worn, but no holes in them. And then they go, we have volunteers who sort through it, they put it on the floor, and it gets distributed. We also have a free um, walk-in health clinic at the Amherst Survival Center that's operated by volunteer um, medical volunteers, five, three doctors and five nurses who volunteer their time. That's on Monday and Thursdays. And I'm going to give you this brochure, which has a schedule of all of our programs right in the middle, so you can see it. Um, the walk-in health clinic was set up about 10 years ago. Um, so that's before the Affordable Care Act as a way to try to make sure that people who weren't insured were able to find a doc to have a doctor see them. Then things changed in the medical field and it was really and we were in a primary care shortage. So now it's really about getting people primary care when they need it. Thank you. And referring them on to specialists. But it's not the only thing that we have that you can walk in and see a doctor and not have an appointment. If our, one of our doctors recommends a prescription, a medical test, a specialist appointment, and a person can't afford to pay for it or the copay, the Amherst Survival Center can help them pay for it. So the clinic sort of functions as an all-in-one place. You don't have to let us know in advance. You can just show up. On Mondays, you can show up for lunch from 12 to 1 and then walk into the clinic at 12.30 at or 1 o'clock. Yeah. Um, and it's very, very valuable. The last Thursday, I was, we have a late day on Thursday till 7, and our clinic is in the late afternoon. And the young woman walked in with a piece of paper. She had just gotten a job, and circled on the piece of paper was employment exam. But she had no doctor, and no primary care person had an opening for her. 
So she came and she said, do you do this? We said, yes, we do. She went in, she saw the doctor. She, 20 minutes later, she came out with the form filled out. And then I saw her and I said, would you like to get some clothes for your new job? And she went right into the store and she picked That's out awesome. a very nice outfit for her first day of work. And then she stuck around and had dinner with us. So it's sort of an all-in-one, low threshold way to get your needs met. Um, the other thing that we have at the Survival Center is we have a job search assistance program, which has an incredible rate of success. I don't do it, so I can brag about it. Um, there's a volunteer that works with people who are looking for work to identify possibilities, find the application, fill out the application, get the resume in, tutor them on interview skills, help them throughout, coach them throughout the entire process. And she has an incredible rate of success. I mean, it's, it's more than 50% of the people get jobs. In addition, this program has job failures. And of course, everybody is welcome to use this program, including people from Granby. Um, one way that the Survival Center builds community is through our volunteer program. So I'm also going to send you some of these. People do not have to volunteer in order to get services, but a lot of people like to volunteer, or people who are getting services like to volunteer. We hear a lot of times from participants they want to give back, and this gives them an opportunity to do that, but it also gives retired people, students, young parents who maybe their kids have just gone to school for the first time an opportunity to really be part of a community that's helping to make life better for people. Um, and so we have regular orientations. We have a lot of regular sort of volunteer gigs in the center. In terms of helping us deliver services, we ask people to think about a two to three hour weekly commitment. But we also have commitments that are monthly if someone can't do that. Um, and it's people stay for a long time as volunteers. We're often on people's um, who are retiring's bucket lists, which I recently found out that people say, oh yeah, I've had this on my bucket list and I retired. I signed up and I'm like, wow, that's something to be on some people's bucket list to volunteer. But it's a really good program. And you're literally every day meeting people, helping people, um, and feeling good that you live in a community that's doing that all the time. So can I answer any questions? No, but you're, you do have an appointment to come here. I, well, to the I hope Council so. on Aging, I mean. Yes, I do. Well, we're, we're working on it. We're talking to all each right. other. Um, I want to make sure. <laughs> That's a whole other discussion is to find out, um, for me, do the majority of people who are elderly who live in Granby, do, how do they get here? Like, do they drive here? Because if they drive here, they could drive to us. But if they don't drive here, then we need to think about other transportation options for folks. Mostly they drive here. The majority of drive here. Yeah. So, yeah, the majority of so that'll be a good opportunity to talk to people about coming. Mm -hmm. Because then they can carpool, they can get good groceries, fresh milk. We also make other things available for um, seniors that they may like. Yeah. Um, so. I just thinking too, it'd be nice if we can find a, another avenue where you can get this information out to other people besides the, you know, the senior citizens, but also other people that need it because not everybody, unfortunately, watches this. I'm so. open to any suggestion you have. Yeah, I'm just kind of thinking about it. Being, do you have a? Is there a town newspaper or a town newsletter? That's um, Trish is in charge of. Go ahead, Trish. Uh, GCAM, Granby Community Access and Media Inc. So, so we could provide you with information. You if you provide like. us with information. We put stuff on the bulletin board for you. You can make your own set of pages. That's great. Um, let's do that. Yeah. Let's do that. Community Access, let's do that. And then if you wanted to also put things on the Granby web, the town website, I could send you these in a PDF format. So you could mm -hmm. easily, if someone's looking for something. I was on the website, and I'm not sure there is a link that says non-government uh, sort of services, but if there is, then I'll be happy to send you a collection of material and information. I'm definitely looking at the options. And I, I'll get you my card, and you should feel free to call me if you have any questions. Um, thank you. Thanks thank for the you. opportunity. Oh, thank you. That's, that's good stuff. It really it's, is. Please, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to say it again. I would love to give you a tour of the Survival Center when we're open, because what I just described to you is all these different programs. So you're thinking in your head, okay, so they got this, and they got that, and they got that. But when you come to the Survival Center when we're open and you see everything happening, it's They do a lot way. like the, the Springfield Survival Center. We do more. I wasn't, I wasn't comparing you, I'm I was just, just saying. I, I'm, 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 <laughs> I, well, I'm just saying, we... There's so much more happening in the Survival yeah. Center in Amherst because we also have outside well, consultants coming good. in. It's it really just, does. It's, um, it's, and I'm not putting them down at all. No. It's just we're designed to be sort of a one-stop shop 
for a lot of different needs that people have. No, I so. think it's, it sounds great. I'll, I'll definitely make it a, a point to stop in. Great. And, yeah. Make sure you look for me and tell me Absolutely. in advance and we'll have lunch together. I will. Okay. Sounds definitely good. will. Okay. Thanks for coming in. And Thank you very Thank you. much. Okay. Next up, Jay Joyce. Come on up, Jay. Hey, guys. Well, you got good news and you got bad news. The Massachusetts Department of Energy decided to change the rules on the grant process for of course 2018. They did which we all expect. So we had to redo it. But the good news is the Energy Committee had a three-year plan to get all this work done. So we were able to substitute other items mm -hmm. that were no longer. And in a brief description, the Massachusetts Department of Energy will no longer fund electric vehicle charging units unless the town pays 25% of the cost, and they all have to be 100% public. So until the town decides how they want to give the energy away, or they want to charge people on a visa, we had to cancel them off the grant. Addition to that, the new library did not have five years of data yet, because it's only four years old. So anything we listed for the new library would not have passed. So the good news is we had enough to put back in the grant, we're up to $235,513 to administer this grant for this year. The current list you have in front of you, uh, we got prices for as late as $435 today. That's why some of them have pen and ink changes in them. And Chris has already gone over them with us. And like I say, the committee had to get together quick. But luckily, we had a three year plan, so we were able to substitute. And um, this is what we come up with here, final for 2018. What's a plug load control? Okay, everything like that TV behind Chris, even though it's off right now, yep. it's eating electricity. Okay. So it's, it's something like that, particularly in a junior, senior high school, yep. with all the computers, it's going to knock all that down to decrease the amount of bills. Yeah, they call it they call it vampire something, something like, like that, that. They, and they have uh, computer power management ones which are the more expensive ones so they need the bigger name mm -hmm. but load controller is basically the same thing it's like a clapper <laughs> shuts the power off completely yep so you have no electrical leakage going to any item that is currently not in use and be in hmm. charge for it. See, the TV, TV uses power to stay warm, so it comes right on. Yep. What will happen is with that, it'll just take a little walk. And come that's on. right. That's it. And that's something you might want to consider for your own house if, you're, if you want to decrease the power or your electric payments in your own house. And you've got major items like that that only use some time, they will be drawn on electricity, particularly the older units in your house. Well, they just plug into the outlet? Yes, they plug into the outlet, and then you plug your appliances Good. into them. Hmm. And that's one way we're trying to cut the cost of the town down. Well, and we're still trying to reach a goal, right? Yeah, 20%. We only have decreased 4% to date uh, with this. We're calculating that we're going to be somewhere, we're hoping for 9 to 10% after this year. That's what we're hoping for. But Mark, I, I realize you had your surgery and you were out. One of the major problems we had with the junior senior high school, yep. you, know, you know they put the new LED lights in in 2016? Okay. But their 2016 and 2017 electric usage is higher than 2015. So the only thing that we can guess, and it is an educated guess, is all those computers they got in there now. And that's why we'll, we put $8,700 for load control was just for the junior senior high school. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be interesting to see how that turns out. It would too. be. It would be because if you put energy saving items in, 
you think your energy usage is going to go down and not up. I know Steve and Glenn were here when we did the charts and all that yep. stuff, but we weren't about to do that again today. Okay. And I did email to you in case you want yep. to look at it. Yeah. I hope you feel better. That's all that counts. Do you want, yeah, it took me till last Monday. I was like, it took me three weeks to feel. Mm -hmm. I wasn't feeling pain, but just feeling. Yeah, and mm -hmm. so, but I'm glad that's over. So, if there's anything, we would have liked to make the two hundred fifty thousand, but you can't do half of an ECM, mm -hmm. and we needed to leave some of the high payback ECMs for next year, otherwise you won't get any money next year because you gotta do a balance of the load. So we got as close as we could. It looks like there's some good turnaround too on on some of these. Yes, there is. Yeah. I mean you, you can the load control is like it's two point five years they've paid for. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Now Chris has the application for you, Mark, uh, if and when you want to sign it. Should be in front of him. Oh it should be in front of him. Okay. <laughs> Um, no idea. Is this it? Yeah, it should be Appendix C on the back. I see a paper clip, so I'm assuming Kathy put it at the end. Is that Appendix C? Um, yep. Attachment C, certification of application. Right. All right. And you're the only one authorized to sign because it is a green community. On behalf of the town of Granby? Yes. Because the town of Granby is a green community, not an individual department. Am I, I'm, so I'm the chief executive officer? Yes, you are. Wow. You're the chairman. You're the chief. For two more months. <laughs> <laughs> And that has to be in Massachusetts DOER hands by no later than 5 o'clock on Friday. And we still have some paperwork to clean up. Like I said, we got the final prices at 435 this afternoon. So we still got more work to do on this. But it's nothing that's going to be entailing you guys. It's just documentation cleaning up. Right. Need to drive that down. We don't, okay. we don't need it. He needs it. Actually, you yeah. have to upload it. I'll just make sure we have a copy. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Okay. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, unless you got no more questions on the green community, uh, at the last meeting, I was unfortunately you weren't here, Mark. Yeah. The board wanted to know about the solar Massachusetts renewable program, and they had us go out. Thank you. And um, we actually called the company, and we called National Grid, we being the Energy Committee, and we had Granby's Energy audited to see what was fitting. Mm -hmm. And that's on your second page is the spreadsheet. There is one item that is not there. It's called you know, Miller Street, which I believe, Mark, you're probably familiar with from the past when yep. they were thinking solar out there. That just came to our attention, so it's not on our spreadsheet, but it's going to be thrown into the mix. And the Reader's Digest version of this program, the t municipality or our town can be paid anywhere from $120,000 to $195,000 per year to lease town-owned land to a solar developer to put the solar in. If it was a perfectly flat land with no trees to cut down, you would get approximately $195,000 because there's not much overhead to mm -hmm. clear it. If it's a heavily wooded lot or something like that, it's going to be substantially less. Now, that also includes the screening. Um, naturally, this requires a special permit through the planning board because it's over 250 KW. Mm -hmm. So if we have a lot of residents that come out and they want screening, that'll come out of the 195,000 a year as part of the overhead cost. But we're mainly looking at places like I just told you, Mark, on Miller yeah. Street, which is nobody, it's, it's landlocked. And Wayne Tack has told us that he let them through yep. to put it there. And he's been, yep. yep, he, he said he has no problem with that. Another area, for example, is the Granby Old Quarry, where nobody can see it because nobody knows where it is, so you never see it. And there's other 
items on your spreadsheet, listen to paper. But each individual one has to be approved by you or the voters. Now, here's our problem, and we need legislative help on this. Granby being so sparsely populated, the substation in Granby will not take any more of these solar fields. So we need, after talking to the National Grid, they recommended that we contact our um, state senators and representatives, and uh, like Senator Eric Lesser. And this is the pet project of Governor Baker's. So he doesn't think it's going to be very much problem if Governor Baker whispers in a national grid ear yep. to upgrade the substation. So until the substation is upgraded, we cannot go any farther on this project. Okay. Uh, the Energy Committee is willing to go to Eric Lesser, but only with your permission, with anybody else that you and Chris deem you want there. It's your call when and where. We're ready to go when you give us the word, because we are appointed by you. Yep. We do not make our own decisions, just recommendations. So with that being said. Uh, One question, for you, or two, actually two questions sure. for you, Jay. When they're going through to install the solar panel fields, Will they be contacting endangered species? To our knowledge, the answer is no, but the study has not gone that deep yet. The deepness, as far as the study performed to date, we wanted not to spend any money. Yep. Uh, so we're looking at the size of the fields, the location of the areas that's on your spreadsheet, but we have not gone down to the in-depth study or even got the Conservation Committee involved yet. The only reason I'm saying is that field behind Wayne Tax. I do know there's Hartford fern back there that is an endangered species, and mm -hmm. there's also the yeah. blue spotted blue spot salamander. salamander some kind of turtle. That, that, there's the box turtle. Yeah. The yeah. box turtle is there too. So the issue is, is I think we have to make sure that before they're installed that they do look at endangered species and go through that. Well, with the planning board and the required process that this is going to have to go through, all of that will be done. But before we can even consider a site, we have to upgrade the substation. Now, in addition to upgrading the substation, mm -hmm. will they have to upgrade the wires going between the poles? That would be up to National Grid. They have to do a, they have to check, they said. Because traditionally, when they put out wires, according to National Grid, they put larger than required, so they don't have to come back. But they would have to do a measurement yeah. of how much th this is going to produce. Uh, like a 15-acre spot will produce 4 megawatts of electricity. So you take that figure, and we'll just throw a number of 5. Say the or to select and pick five different sites. Four times five is 20 megawatts, okay? How much will the substation have to be upgraded and will the current lines carry it? Yeah. That's all to be determined. But the first thing is we have to go the route to get the substation upgraded. And like I say, we're ready to go with you, but you guys call the shots. All right. Oh, it says, this is on a first come, first serve basis for a town. So if another town gets their application in before Granby and National Grid approves it, they get the money. So it's something you really don't want to sit on too long. Okay. Because most of it is gone now. Because we've been talking about this for a couple months. Yep. If there's nothing else for me, I will happily bow out of here. All right. We thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for all your efforts. No Thanks, problem. Jay. The entire committee it. as a whole. And we'll get that grant in on time. All right, good. Yep. All right. No, two day. Like uh, Charter day. All right. Charter day. Ed Holberg is here. Ed Holberg is the one applying for oh, the Ed's license. Ed's applying for it and uh, yeah. Charter day. Oh, you just support? Oh, what a great group of supporters. <laughs> Hi, Ed. Hi. 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 How are you? 
explain okay yeah uh, explain what you're going to do okay. the out the days hours of operation so on and so forth right. uh we it's something that we weren't planning on but we were approached by the charter day committee if we would do it to help mm -hmm. the, they wanted a beer tent this year and so uh, we said we would look into it so basically uh we're applying for the two days it's going to be friday and saturday we're not going to do beer or anything there's no no sunday sales mm -hmm. uh, and i think we're opening uh probably be opening about uh, three or four o'clock friday afternoon mm -hmm. and we play we have the beer tent i think they want to keep it to 10 o'clock even though they're going to be open till 11 they asked if we could close it down at 10. is that right yes. so there's a couple of bands playing Friday night, uh, some music, and we'll have a beer tent there. We're going to operate as uh, the post. Uh, we're going to do it. It's The monies really aren't going to be going to the bar. We're using uh, our our abilities to do everything. Yep. But the money, the, basically, it's going to be a fundraiser for the post, okay. which is yeah. the upstairs. That's what we do. So anyway, two days. Uh, Saturday, I think we'll be doing from like... Uh, 12 or 1 o'clock to the same thing, but a little bit into 10 o'clock again. They got a couple of bands. Uh, we're going to be under a tent. Uh, we're going to have, uh, I know we got ranges with the police. They have one entrance coming in for the people buying it. We'll be doing armbands. Uh, we'll have people check in IDs, and it'll be issued a, an armband, I think, is what we'll do. We're going to try to find a special band so that they can't just bring in a little change each day type of thing. Uh, I have uh, made arrangements with Budweiser. They're going to bring a wagon in and set it up for us, which holds all the beer we're going to need. And it has eight taps on it, so we'll be tap tapping right off the wagon. Mm -hmm. And it has a generator, which keeps the beer cold. Uh, and they, we, the arrangements there are good because, uh, you know, that's a big expense. Uh, so basically, they'll deliver everything, set it up, and we only pay what we tap. So wow. if we have 25 kegs in that thing and we only tap 20, yep. the five, they don't even charge, you know. By the time they do, we're not even gonna pay for it at the beginning because by the time, they'll give us a bill when they deliver it. Yep. Then when they pick it up, they'll send us another bill yeah. with the credits. Yeah. So basically, and they're, they're very good. They're gonna make up uh, some signs for us that we can put around, but they're supplying that uh, and they'll pick it up. It's, uh, we're gonna use more bartenders from the bar but you're all tip certified. Yep. Uh, and I'm gonna go up there and be in charge of it. So I run the club, so it's, the, and then we'll have some volunteers from the post to help us with, they can't serve beer because we have to keep things separate, yep. but they're gonna help us with, they might help us with some things like help and check IDs, yep. just make sure everything's going all right, that type of thing. Uh, and we got a, uh, uh, I'm in the process, uh, Took out a, uh, we're taking out a separate policy, liquor and liability policy for the town and for everything, because that'll be separate from ours. We don't want to use ours. Right. We've already checked into that. Uh, and basically that's it. And it's hopefully, a lot of people said they want a beer, the beer, we will be, it'll be beer and wine, mm -hmm. but it'll all be tapped off the, mm -hmm. the thing. Oh, nice. Uh, there'll be no hard liquor sold. Chief, any questions, comments? No, uh, we kind of ironed everything out. One of the things that uh, we probably talked about after the, uh, uh, well, I don't know when the application went in, but it was uh, that during the day they were hoping to be able to have allow families into the alcohol area. So if mom and dad wanted to go in while their, and their child came in with them, especially a younger child, I would be okay with that. Uh, but as I think we talked about, after four uh, yeah, as soon as four o'clock, it's no, no more kids inside there. It's 21 only. Uh, and above, which is would be helpful. Um, no, I think I think pretty much we've already talked about what we would do with police officers um, for both the bands and the alcohol area and all the other stuff. Um, I just kind of want to reiterate that there's a lot of unknowns mm -hmm. with uh, the bands that are coming in. And, um, yeah, we do have some big bands. Uh, the estimate that I gave was based on you know um, what we reasonably hope to see if it's much more than that we would have to get other coverage and I don't expect that I don't Friday night will be the biggest and then Saturday night you know I had you know that type of you know the three the three main bands I know of were all all good bands so as long but as, the, as long as the fencing is up the way that we discussed 
and that um, yeah. they're vigilant about checking IDs. So, yeah. sounds, yeah. sounds good, as long as you guys have everything working. Yeah, and we're going to, like I said, we won't have anything Sunday. I think Sunday we're going to be too involved with the parade and some sure. other stuff that, yeah. you know, because the, the post is uh, going to be marching and we're coordinating other stuff. So, uh, but... Yeah, we'll be pretty, del you know, checking IDs out because I'm using my regular bartenders, yeah. and that's they do that anyway, they so they know how to do that. Uh, and uh, so, it should hopefully we'll find out if it doesn't rain and all that stuff, uh, and we'll see if it works. Something we we might we'll probably try again, but if it doesn't, you know, the biggest thing is, uh, well, in the years past we found we were able to get good pricing on liability, which was an yep. unknown, uh, and. Uh, we didn't want to use ours from the bar because it's separate and we have separate policies for everything to make sure. But I'll be there myself personally, uh, making sure everything's running smoothly uh, so that, uh, you know, try to make it a good thing event for the town. Yeah. And hopefully it'll bring in more money and revenues. I hope so. Mm -hmm. For everything. How, how large is the fence in the area? We're still working on getting a tent um, because we don't want to use the food tent as also the beer tent. Like we were originally thinking we would split it half-half, but we're going to keep the food separate because after 4 o'clock we don't want anyone over, or sorry, under 21 in that area. So um, we're working on getting a tent. It's, I don't know, we didn't, we didn't really. We They're not going to use the pavilion this year? No, no. Because someone just told me, I just found out the other night, the band told me they're not going to be playing, they're going to be playing under a tent. They're at Target? Yes. No, they're playing no. under the gazebo. They said they're not. Yes, they yeah. oh. Was it out of the blue? Yeah. <laughs> Get there. Right. I'll talk to them. Yeah, they were under the impression that they were going to be under a separate tent. Yeah. Because oh, they got... The gazebo, separate from yeah. the tent. Yeah, and that was the first time I heard about it, because I want to make sure that, you know, what, where we, you know, where everything is. Yeah, we well, yeah. yeah. Okay. There's tables and stuff underneath the tent. I mean, what's, uh, what's for the during the for during that? the uh, when the bands are playing in, in the, uh, the 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 what I've been told is they we're going to take all the tables out. Are we talking about the because um, when you say t we have two tents, so I'm just trying to clarify which tents we refer well, to. Well, I'm it's talking the tent about side or the beer tent side. Well, if you have a beer tent side, there won't be any there won't be any tables in the beer tent. After four o'clock, there's no tables over 21 only in the beer tent section. After four o'clock. Gonna have tables? No, the tables are being removed. Right, that's what I thought. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Tables and chairs. People will stand. It'd be a standing room. Yeah. We were we were talking about at the last meeting. Oh, possibly, possibly for chairs. the older people having like yeah, an area for good. the older people to sit. Set some chairs, but no tables. Yeah. <laughs> no picnic tables. <laughs> yeah. Why no tables? Yeah. yeah. Oh, because, well, I thought it was a draw too, I don't know, I just thought it would draw too much. Like People said, well, I was already here this afternoon having lunch, why can't I have it again? I thought it would be, be better to remove the table at least. No, I don't think you have a problem place. because we're not going to let people... If you don't have a problem with it, I don't have a problem leaving the table with it. I just try to make whatever we need. No, if you could be able to sit down and, you know... Have a refreshment? I would rather that, quite frankly, than yeah. a corral yeah. full of people standing. Because everybody's just actually, people actually you're, you're right, you know, okay. people you have people standing other. there watching and they're holding beers and stuff. You know, somebody could jostle the wrong person the wrong yeah. way. You know, type exactly. of thing. Just so relax. I mean, limited number of tables and stuff. Yeah. You know, table stand, person. Stand, like yeah, no problem. And what? Sounds good. good. Saves everybody a little work. So. Friday night, there'd be no children in the tent. After four. After four. Oh, well, well, what time you start serving? We won't start serving until four o'clock. Okay. What What are your actual hours of operation? Because that has to go on the license. You said between three and four on Friday. Three. And you said twelve and one on Saturday. It's four to ten. On four to Friday. four to ten on Friday. <laughs> we won't be serving. They, I don't think. What time does it open? We open at four. Four, so we won't we won't be serving until. And on Saturday is they open at noon. noon. So noon is it going to so be noon to ten on Saturday? All right. So yeah, yeah. I got to ask, what what are the benefits from having children in there from noon to four, and not later on? Well, some will they'll be with their parents if they're in there. Well, I'm assuming someone will be with their parents later on too. So. I don't have a problem with them never being in there. That's um, where I'm going. That's I don't, where you're going. Yeah. However. Um, you know, the, the request was made when we were having the conversations. And it, it, my biggest concern is I didn't want anybody under 21 in there when they were expecting these larger crowds of, I don't want to, of just 
people that were there for a specific purpose other than to be with their kids around the around the park. So that's and I, and I guess the way I'm kind of looking at it to me, this is more of a a bar being outside versus a restaurant being outside. So I'd rather not have children at all inside there, just for reason that you know they're around the alcohol and stuff like that. I don't think need for it. That's just my take on it. Well, they're just well, people. Well, when they come in in the uh, in the early part, I mean, it's fine with me if they don't if you don't have the kids in there. But when they come in the early part of the day, when they're there before four o'clock, they might buy food and sit down there, and it's going to be kind of. But that's a different tent. No, but if they brought, if they show up at that tent with food, they're not going to kick them out. I, th like, I think the way that the conversation went when we first started talking about this, they were talking about getting one larger tent and kind of including a portion of the alcohol area under that tent. So that's kind of how the conversation started. And then when they separated it, um, that was one of the things that was kind of going away. Um, so that's See, to, to me, it's just, it's, to me, it's easier if it's just black and white. And then, so now it's at 3 o'clock, 3.30. Someone's not going in or a kid saying, well, you got at 4 o'clock, got to be out of here. That's just my take on it. That's all. Because it's... I'm just going by the parameters of what they put well, together. The reason I'm saying, but the only reason I'm saying, because people are thinking kids, they're thinking people, well, Most you know, they. 10, 11 years old, but there's also teenagers going to be floating in there, too, with... Parents and so I just well, parents, eliminate it. And parents are, you know, obviously hopefully responsible enough. Bridget, I'm, I'm not Bridget. saying that. Yeah, I was just thinking, like, like Ed was actually saying. I think it's the point where you can bring food into the beer tent, but you can't bring beer into the food tent. So if it's early enough and you're having food, you want your kids. Yeah, to they can bring food into the beer. 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 We can't. You know. I yeah. think if right. the right. if the signs are up and it's like you know no kids after four, then you know. You know, it's. Uh, yeah, we have food sometimes at the bar, and like we do some nights, and parents come in there with their kids, you know, to eat, and they can come into the bar and eat as long as you know the parents are with them, you know, and there's food being served. And then, but at a certain point, they can't they can't sit at the bar, for instance. Right. Uh, uh, and uh, but if someone during you know, a day, like if we they start the yeah being on Saturday, what yeah, time? They're starting at noon. So if people want a family wants to come in here and listen to the band and uh, decide if someone comes over and get a, gets a beer with their in there with their kids and they want to get some food too, then they would, can't really say you can't eat food. Uh, we we can't you know say that they can't eat food in that tent. Well, you can say whatever you want to say. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> that's up to you. <laughs> well, nah, not really. I just Ryan, so, what's your name? This is the first Try and introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Brian Gelnett. I just moved here about a year ago. Hello. Hello. Um, this is the first year they brought back a beer. I came here since I was 10 years old for Charter Day, and I, you know, now that I have two five-year-old twin daughters, um, that's why I got them all. But walking around that hot place, I was like, hey, I need a beer. So this is the first year we're bringing the beer back. I'm taking care of the bands, or I'm, I'm trying to adjust the bands. Um, with the tent and the gazebo, and I've never done this before. You know, other than playing out, I was in a band, so. Um, but bringing the beer back, bringing the bands, and we all want it to be family friendly. And I've talked to the bands that I know um, that are gonna be here. I'm like family friendly. Um, so there's quirks to work out. So I, 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 I think the crystal will be out. Um, I just want every, I want it to continue. I want it to keep going. There has to be, you know, fear of mine, separation of family and, and all that. Well, they'll be selling food at the vendors, and even people coming well, in after four is. are going to want to, they might want to bring some usually, food over while you're standing here. Usually, right. a beer tent is separate, totally. And you have to be 21 to walk into that gate, period. No one underage. The, the, the kids are off in a different section. Uh -huh. If you want a beer, 
somebody wants a beer, they're in that tent, they stay in that tent, after, after you consume whatever you want to consume, then you go back out. But up until then, no kids under 21 should be allowed in the tent. Cut and dry. If, if, you're gonna, if they're going to bring their kid in, they have to accompany with at least one parent. Well, that's where we'd be. Yeah, but I mean, it's not, you, nobody under 21 should enter that area at all. Well, I, unless the company with parent. You gotta have a bartender working. Well, that's a different story. You know, bartenders only have to be 18. Yes. <laughs> All right, so. Um, but I, I don't, I'm just selling the beer. Yes. Uh, so that whatever they want to do, uh, the food, the food ways, but you know, the kids, I, you know, it'd be easier, you know, well, after four o'clock, there are no young kids in there. Mm -hmm. That's the deal. Just to um, clarify, we the parents would the kids would only be in there with their parent. It's only if they're eating lunch and the parents having a beer and they're all sitting down eating lunch. That's the only thing that we were asking for to make it more family friendly. Mm -hmm. And then at four, once we get the bigger bands in there, like the mm -hmm. more lively bands, um, to then say, well, sorry, parents, you can't. The kids can't come in because we don't want. We also don't want the kids to be around that crowd either. Um, depending on what the crowd's going to be. Like if mm -hmm. they're sitting there drinking beer after beer after beer, we don't want the kids to be sitting next to them either. But we figure from 12 to 4, it's mellow, it's more of a family atmosphere. Mm -hmm. um, even probably till 7, but we said the cutoff was 4, so that's what we were going with. I don't but know. I don't they're not know. going in by themselves. They're not, yeah, they're only going in with their parents if they're sitting down and eating mm -hmm. while their parents are having a drink. Right. Yeah, there would be no teenagers in there. You know, that well, teenagers are kids, so you got to be careful. I know, but there will be no teenagers. We'll, but they, would, they won't be there with their, you without, know, their parents. Uh, without their parents. I, I believe the board should leave that up to the committee and the police chief to monitor and enforce. Yeah, that's good. Fine with me. Yeah. So you, they won't be on the license that it's either allowed or not allowed? So then you're leaving the chief up to well, the issue is quote, police it. Yes. Well, well, the issue is if a parent's in there with their children, they keep drinking a lot of beer. The police officer in charge there should have the right to be able to say, leave. No, that's up to the bartender. I think they always, well, yeah, I think. Yeah. Well, our bartenders will. Well, you have two things there. I think, generally speaking, the board gives uh, the police officers the right to trespass somebody during Charter Day weekend. The, the, whoever's serving the alcohol has a responsibility to make sure they're not serving somebody mm -hmm. who's under the influence. Um, if our officers thought that somebody yeah. was under the influence and they were going to drive, they wouldn't, you know, they would do if they could stop them. You know, uh, well, we can leaving, it up, leaving it up to, to, to me and the committee, there's, there's a lot of gray area there, so it, I, I mean, far be it for me to tell you what to do. Uh, I can only tell you what I would rather have happen, either yes or no it. Um, one way or the other. Um, uh, if it's no, it's not going to hurt my feelings at all. Um, we were just trying to work something out that was somewhat reasonable. Um, but to just say that we're going to leave it up to, to me, I'm, you know, I'm there, but I'm not there 24 hours a day. I, I, don't, know. Um, I don't know. I'm fine with what's been proposed with a 12 to 4. Um, mm -hmm. um, I mean, I'm not. I'd, I'd rather keep the the alcohol separate from the kids. But that's, that's just my thought on it. Nothing. I mean, just it's it's the alcohol is for the adults. That's the, what the tents for, and a lot of other places you go to, um, like the Hoyoke St. Patrick's Day Road Race and stuff like that. It's a beer tent. It's set up for adults. That's the way it's set up for that reason because it's it, you know it's I know what you're saying about the food and stuff being brought there, but. It's not to say some people are going to start going in there at 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock and start having the drinks. You know, and then people are starting, you know, sure. they're starting to have a couple of drinks, whatever, the, a couple of swear words come out or whatever, and you have the kids around there and stuff like that. Someone gets offended. It's, Sorry it would be. But that's just like that's I said, I'm going, you my know, thought. The, the guidelines are what they want to do for that. I mean, uh, it's easier on my people if we don't have to worry about any kids at all. Uh, our bartenders are trained to that. You know, it's, first of all, someone can't come over and buy three beers or four beers. Yeah. It's, you know, they're limited. You got to have, you get one beer at a time. 
all I would ask is to really to, to the committee is to, to think about it as far as when's the last time we had alcohol at Charter Days? Plus five, five six right. years ago. It was when Opa Opa came, right? Okay, so maybe coming back, take baby, baby steps and see how this year goes and then for the future instead of putting everything there and you know then if something does go wrong it's like well gee uh, maybe we should have did something different maybe take the baby steps now and then see how everything goes and look at the, you know the following year but that's just that's just me anything else on this sign this now or no okay. <laughs> all right Sorry, go no. ahead um i think in the past uh the license has always has also said that all health costs to remain in that area yeah, that's fine. We don't want. We to haven't do. written yeah, the license that's, that's, that's not the actual. because we didn't know the hours of operation. We didn't know everything. That's the issue. That's what we're trying to get tonight, so that we can prepare the license for the board to sign at their next meeting. Yeah, no, it, it should be contained in that town. Yeah, right. Yeah, we don't want people walking around. Okay, so we're all set. Yes. All right. And next meeting, we'll sign it. We'll vote on it, sign it, whatever. Okay. So now it's, it's uh, I see that I, Kathy said it's going to be $100 a day, each day separate. Okay. Yes, sir. Take care of that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. We'll talk tomorrow. Okay. Here we right. Yeah, we're done with you. Thank you. Thank you. Leave while you can. <laughs> Did you have a chance to? Uh, yes. Okay. And uh, it's been forwarded to the appropriate department. I'm not sure on the level of it, but we'll know. It, it's a wow situation. Yeah. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Thanks. Do you want to go straight to the budget, or do you want to do the? No, I want you to do your other stuff first. Okay. Make a motion to accept departmental reports. I'll second the motion. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Make a motion to approve and sign maintenance warrant FY 18 51 52 Where are they? Did I? Yeah, I didn't see those. They were in the two B sign folder that you signed, huh? Mark. Did I sign them? Mark, the warrants are in the blue ah. folder. <laughs> well, well, at least they didn't jump didn't up and slap me in the face. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. So we have a second. I'll second the motion. All in favor. Uh, you got uh, me. That's fine. <laughs> I can live with it. <laughs> Gonna have to probably get used to it at some point. Uh, All right. Uh, you want to do number three here? Sewer abatements? No, Let's, number four is sewer abatements. Let's do number four first. Uh, can I get the folder from up at, in front of Glenn? Okay. Yeah. We're almost done here. Make a motion to approve and sign sewer abatements. <laughs> Mark, yep. Okay. Can you hand yep. me that folder up in the front of Glenn there? Yep. New business. Yeah. Right. We have had applications for sewer abatements for three accounts. First one is for 81 Pleasant Street. Uh, that connection has been disconnected from the uh, sewer system. A bill was erroneously issued, so we are abating the bill in full in the amount of $274. The second one is for Pleasant Valley Estates uh, for their 59 Pleasant Street account. Uh, based upon the actual metered water usage, they should have only been charged for three EDUs, not 14. We're abating $3,041.50 for the second half of fiscal year 17. And then we have for Pleasant Valley Estates, same address, uh, based upon the actual metered usage of water. 
It should have been three EDUs and not 14, and an abatement of $3,014 is being issued. All right. The board needs to approve those abatements. As read. As read. I'll second. All those in favor? Uh, Aye. Aye. All right. Okay. Um, and I have the FY19 budget packet I gave to the board. This is a balanced budget at this point in time. It is using the governor's state aid numbers. It is using the, the calculations done by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education based upon the governor's numbers of Granby's minimum contribution. It includes the in-kind chargeback to the schools. The two items that I don't have and I'm hoping to get, one of them I'm hoping to get this week is the actual transportation number for fiscal year 19 for the school. And I will be getting the actual Pathfinder assessment on the March 14th meeting of Pathfinder. And so basically I did a guesstimate based upon FY18 assessment. Uh, plus, uh, I think we're, our population was going up like three students. So. so I just put a number in there. Hopefully it'll come in less than what I have. So, um, But basically it's a straightforward budget. Uh, I have three capital articles that were approved by the, I'm sorry, four capital articles that were approved by the Capital Improvement Committee. First one is a cruiser for 44,000, a mini pumper rescue for the fire department for 225,000, a replacement dump truck for 150,000, and a door patcher machine for 80,000. I'm also putting in 175000 towards our OPEB liability. And I know the, the school had originally put in a request for a new roof for the high school. However, the Capital Improvement Committee did not receive any quotes to substantiate the number that was being requested by the school. They gave them until February 14th to submit the quotes. We have not received any quotes to date. However, with all the leakage that is going on there, I believe we are going to have to put that on as a special article. And I believe it'll probably be about 1.5 million if you really look at what the quote, potential quotes would be, plus architectural fees or engineering fees to design the roof. Okay. Chris, can you explain what the budget recap is and like why like the town has to do a budget recap? The budget recap is basically making sure my revenues equals my expenditures. Okay. Uh, basically it includes what the state aid figure is based upon what I think it we're gonna get from the state. However, all I have now is the governor's numbers. I don't have the Senate and the House versions to be able to try and get a better guesstimate of what yep. I think the true state aid is going to be. For the potential taxes, what we are allowed to do is take the prior year levy limit, which is for FY18 was $11,619,470. To that, we're allowed to increase it automatically by 2.5%. And then we have to do a projection on what I think the new growth is going to be for FY19. The, what I do is I take the last five years new growth figures mm -hmm. and try and guesstimate what okay. I think it's going to be. Right. Um, I look at what it's been for the last three years, plus I look at the anywhere from a one to a five year average and come up with a number. So is this basically a revenue estimate? It's a revenue estimate, yes. And then we have the debt exclusion amount that has to be raised to pay for the debt payment on the school for mm -hmm. FY19. Then to that I add any monies that we will be appropriating from the stabilization fund that we normally do to reduce the tax levy. Yep. For 19, FY19, it's about 121000 
Other available funds of 291, uh, if you look at page two, basically that is the dog revolving fund monies plus the uh, chapter, chapter 90 mm -hmm. allocation for FY19. And then we have uh, our local receipts, our guesstimate on local receipts. Offset receipts are basically the fire burning permits. And then we have what we are be raising in enterprise fund revenues for a gross total revenue of 20728234 Now from that we have cherry sheet offsets of 482673 which are the offsets are the give me one second the offsets from the uh, state aid figures are the <coughs> school choice number which is 471,000 and then we have aid to public libraries of 11,619 then we have our Hampshire County Sheriff's Regional Lockup Assessment of 5928. Then we have the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission offset or assessment of $1,007. Then we have to pay our cherry sheet charges of $1,026,905. And then we put in a number of what we think the abatements are that are going to be issued for FY19. In FY18, we actually raised 185,000, so I put 187,000 in there, and that gives us our net revenue for operating budgets of 19,024,709. Then we have our net school spending required requirement, which is 9,397,389. From that, I take our chargebacks, which are basically what we spend in municipal budgets for school related expenses of two million to give a net figure of seven million five twenty one one twenty three. We also give them three hundred five thousand above minimum and then I am guesstimating like I said transportation waiting for the true number about eight hundred thirty one thousand so our net school spending for schools is eight eight million three fifty two eight ten. Then below that is our Pathfinder Vocational School Assessment. Guesstimate until I can have the meeting on the 14th of March. Mm -hmm. Then we have our general government budget of 8,719. Enterprise fund budgets of 974,000. The warrant articles is 967,000 for a total government spending of 10,661,000. And to fund that, we're going to, I'm proposing 375000 in borrowing. And uh, like I said, the 120000 from stabilization to reduce the tax levy. And then the enterprise fund numbers and the other available funds. <coughs> so this is, the well, first, the government's, uh, the governor's numbers are usually referred to as a doorstop. Yes. But your budget is not really a doorstop and most most of it it goes to the finance committee but the finance committee I mean they may make changes but they don't make huge changes usually right mm -hmm. according to the bylaw what yeah. happens is is I present a balanced budget to the board of selectmen the board of selectmen approves the balanced budget that's been submitted to them and then goes to the finance committee for their review input and subsequent potential changes yeah. So. And the packet you have is the packet that they get. Yep. Just so you know. All right. Okay. Uh, the board did go over all the budgets that were under their control. The only ones that you hadn't seen that's in this packet are all the elected officials, which is the tax collector, treasurer, town clerk, uh, board of health, uh, board of assessors, all those budgets you didn't see, and the library. So. I gave you what the state aid figures are from the governor. I gave you what the allocation would be based upon a $200 million borrowing for Chapter 90 on the governor's side. So it's all right there for your review. 
glad I have something to read tonight before I go to bed. Yes. Good bathroom reading material for yourself if you so desire. All right. <clears throat> Anybody have any questions or anything? Or? No. Okay. Do you want some more time to look through a plan? Or you no, I'm good. Okay. okay. All right. Um, so we need a motion to, to, to accept the current revi or balanced budget for submission to the Finance Committee. All right. So I'll make a motion. All right. Second. What's your motion? What to percent? accept the balanced budget presented to you for submission to the Finance Committee. I'll second the motion. Okay. Hi. Hi. Okay. And I have one more topic before going into executive session. In the current issue of the voice of the retired public employee, which is issued by the Retired State, County, and Municipal Employees Association of Massachusetts, there's an article regarding the Retired Municipal Teachers Program under the Group Insurance Commission. And it's talking about there's a declining participation in the program because there are some communities that are withdrawing from the system. And when the legislation was passed creating this program, and that was created back in 1972, was that under state law, local officials have the exclusive power to join and leave the Retired Municipal Teacher Program. Okay. The question I want to ask the board is, do they want me to investigate the potential of withdrawing from the program? Because if you look at the local aid assessments from the state to participate in this program, for FY19 it's $403,000. Now, the problem, the issue that I have with the program is based upon the retirement date of the municipal teacher, the town contributes either 90% or 85% of the premium under the GIC program. All other retirees who have to go into the group insurance trust and are retired through the local retirement or county retirement system, we only pay 50% of their premium, which to me isn't fair that a select group of people get more of their premium paid than the other employees of the town. I so I would like to be able to at least investigate it, bring it back to the board for further consideration of, at a future date. I think it's um, like fiduciarily, we have to well, look into that, mm -hmm. regardless of the decision future which I might not even be a part of but um, it's something we should look into. No that's a definite we should look into that. <clears throat> okay. Yes, I don't see why yeah absolutely. And I know you know the school keeps complaining they need more money. Well if you can free up four hundred thousand or some portion thereof that you can then give to the school for additional funding. Mm -hmm. You know, it is a viable it is a viable way of coming up with money for additional funding for school. So that will definitely be prudent to do. Okay. All right. So what do we got left? Uh, uh, the only other topic that may raise an issue with the board is that <clears throat> when we, about a year or so ago, we accepted the certain sections of the health insurance law that basically talked about if plan changes were made that we would a committee would have been formed of a representative from each of the unions and a retiree to review the said changes and to approve them. Come July 1 of 2018, the Hampshire County Group Insurance Trust has already voted changes. We were only notified at the last meeting in January regarding it, or February regarding it, I'm sorry. And the problem is, is if we don't accept the changes, we won't be a member of the Hampshire County Group Insurance Trust. So we may end up running into problems because there are some additional out-of-pocket expenses that are being uh, changed in order to maintain or manage the cost of the programs. 
so we may end up having some union members who may be having some issues over these changes and not being able to approve them ahead of time. Okay. So just as a forewarning for the board. The changes mean like deductibles and cost Deductibles, out-of-pocket expenses, things of that nature. Yeah. That's um, happening across the board everywhere. Mm -hmm. Right, but under this master in the law, these changes are supposed to be brought before this committee of union members and a retiree for their review and approval. However, it's not the town that's doing it. We belong to a trust that's doing it. And we can't get a better rate anywhere else. And if you went to Group Insurance Commission, they, wouldn't, they would make the changes without letting anybody know. They already tried that events. once. Okay, <laughs> so... But I'm just saying, yep. so we may have some issues with maybe one of our unions. Okay. So just as a word of warning. All right. So we're going to go into executive session four. Uh, it's under HIPAA. HIPAA. Because we are the, uh, discussing uh, ambulance receivables. Ambulance. All right. So, and we are going to, what? Did you do the minutes? Oh, motion to approve the minutes. February 20th. You can't vote, Mark. I don't think you were here, were you? No. Make motion to accept the minutes of February 20th. I'll well, second the motion. Okay. okay. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. One abstain. All right. So we will return only uh, to a regular session, only to adjourn. So there. All right. Take a roll. Uh, yeah. Roll call. Sex and I. Bail I. <laughs>